when you take over a big institution like the VNA, you have to look after the stuff, you have to curate it, you mustn't lose it. Or <laughs> <laughs> drop it. But that, and then there's the building. And then there is reimagining the material. And you have to, and the government funds you, but has the story you've had to tell the government changed in the last decade? And does that, does that take away? Does that, does that make it more difficult? Um, well, um, I suppose if you think about, I mean, it's easier to understand the situation for the NA if you, if you understand its history, I think. So, um, the BNA started in 1837, and uh, it was set up as the teaching collection of a new school, the School of Design. And uh, the School of Design was a government initiative, and it was a government initiative that grew out of a, a significant sense of anxiety, and anxiety that British manufactured goods uh, were good on price, uh, but poor on design, and that they were therefore not competing as successfully as they should in the international market. So the government, which then took no responsibility for education, decided that it would uh, move into the field of education and found a school to train up designers to deal with this problem. Uh, and that school of designers, actually the whole network of, of, of schools of art and design around the country, I think they were 120 or so by, by the 1880s. But it's principally, of course, the Royal College of Art. Uh, and the teaching collection of the School of Design is the v and the Science Museum and actually some other museums as well. Uh, so that's sort of where it all started. And the, 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 the initial mission changed a bit after the Great Exhibition of 1851 because the, uh, the new director of the, of the museum, Henry Cole, realised that training designers um, wouldn't really do if you didn't train consumers as well. That's to say, if you had good designs and nobody wanted to buy them, it was all a bit fruitless. So he conceived the idea of a museum which would be a great public institution which would reach as big a public as possible and confront them with, uh, you know, a whole lot of stuff and try and persuade them to think about why things look as they do and also about the choices that they make as consumers. If you kind of roll forward to, uh, to, to now, I suppose that many people would uh, tend to uh, accept the argument that um, while Britain's manufacturing industry hasn't fared uh, terribly well over the last 50 years or so, um, it is still uh, very important, I think, for the British economy that creative design flourishes, that there's this kind of sense that Britain has to move up the value chain and to be good with ideas. And I suppose that what the v &A would say of itself is that it is a great resource for uh, designers and artists, and we can see that because about a third of all the people who come to the v &A are either students or practitioners of art and design. But also that it's a great place for getting people engaged in this thing. Why do things look as they do? What choices do we make as consumers? And that's one of the reasons why the V&A does a lot of fashion shows, because with some notable exceptions, possibly including myself, most people are quite careful about what clothes they buy. And if you ask them, actually, when you're buying a new pair of shoes, do you think at all about which ones you like and which ones you don't? Most people say, well, yes, actually, I think quite carefully. And most people understand that the choices that they make say something about them as a person. So, coming back to the funding issue, well, yes, obviously the V&A was government funded because it was a government initiative. It was something which the government thought it should do because private industry would never do it. It's a classic example of where there's a common interest, but it's not in the interest of any one particular firm to pay for a design school. You know, that's why education classically all the way through the world is a government responsibility. Uh, do, do, you gave an extremely um, good account, as it were, of the kind of big philosophical changes. Can you use the microphone? Sorry. I'm so sorry. You, you gave a very um, persuasive philosophical account, really, of the way in which the philosophy of the DNA was, was expanded. Um, have you seen those kind of changes over the last, say, beyond your know, the last 10 or 15 years? Do governments still see museums? as a source, and the V&A a source of, as it were, stimulating quality understanding and quality thinking 
or do they see them as rather in a rather different way? Does it make a difference? Uh, well, the, the truth is, I'm, I never know what government thinks. Because it's, very, <laughs> it's very hard to know. But I mean, I know what individuals in government think, and I'm, many individuals, both in the last government and in the present government, um, would broadly assent to what I've said. That's to say that the creative industries or creative design is important for the future, and that the VNA is an important part of the infrastructure which sustains that, as also an important way in which, uh, you know, Britain's role in design can be understood better internationally as well. So, but, uh, but the government, you know, the government, in a sense, doesn't really think because that would assume that the government had a single coherent view, and, and I'm sure it does on some things, but on the government, uh, it doesn't really. Um, there are, of course, a whole lot of different ways in, you, in which you can explain any phenomenon, and the arts and the VNA in particular could be explained in quite a different way. I mean, you could say that uh, actually art and culture is what we do with surplus, uh, and that, um, that it's simply a byproduct of wealth, that people will invest in these kind of delightful but useless activities if they have surplus to spend, and that the VNA is a good example of that. You know, Norman's great building, uh, what characterizes the VNA? Well, if you look at it from a distance, what characterizes it is it's got domes and minarets. And I have sometimes wondered how the domes and minarets fit with the, uh, the slogan over our door, which comes from Joshua Reynolds, and which says the complete accomplishment of every art uh, consists in, sorry, no, perfection in every art consists in the complete accomplishment of its purpose, I think. Something along those lines, anyway. So that's the, the, the kind of idea which has been present, I think, um, certainly since Joshua Reynolds' um, time in the arts, which is you know, form follows function, the idea that, um, you know, things must have a purpose. Well, the minarets of the v &A may have a purpose, but it's not completely obvious what that <laughs> purpose is, and so we might want to think about it in a completely other way. And maybe the changes in the funding of the arts derive in part from the fact that government is poor and other funders are rich. So it's not very surprising, is it, that government funding for the arts is, has been actually um, under threat uh, for most of my adult life. Um, but the private funders of all, all kinds have kind of stepped in. Do you, do you, do you find that when you're, when you're putting together exhibitions, this is, this is a very you know, a crude question, and I'm sure it's wrong, but that you think of, you think of the idea, do people think of the idea, do creators think of the idea, or do you think of how it, how it would be financed and sold and whether it would be attractive? I mean, I know that's a stupid question because they're, they're incredibly linked, but and you also, in a sense, have a. It seems to me that one of the things that exhibitions do is reinterpret your permanent materials, don't they? Mm. Uh, in, in a way that's really helpful. I mean, if yeah. you look back at the biographies of a large number of artists or architectural groups or whatever, one exhibition can both bring together something but also stimulate something else. So where does that kind of impulse come from? Uh, well, we don't really do... Uh, we don't normally kind of think of an exhibition just so that we can pitch it to a funder, no. Um, <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is that uh, our attraction to funders is... Um, obviously resides in the kind of prestige of the VNA, um, and yes. uh, so we would be silly, wouldn't we, to undermine our prestige by suddenly announcing that we were going to do, you know, Coca-Cola art or something. Uh, although, it's not, I, I wouldn't really pretend that that's a question which never arises, it, it, it probably it, it, it does arise. Um, so, well, there are so many different questions in what you've asked. If, if the question is, is our exhibition programme um, affected by the availability of commercial sponsorship? No, probably it isn't. But we certainly try, in thinking about our programme, to think about what's going to, to go well with the public, what will be popular, as well as how we can reinterpret our collections, how we can tackle, you know, uh, themes. Um, and if you look at our programme, I suppose that our programme's uh, prime motive is to look at the history of design in its different forms. Um, the exhibition on at the moment, for example, uh, Cult of Beauty, Aestheticism, I highly recommend it. It's an um, incredibly good value and really beautiful when you get to see it. Um, 
but that exhibition is part of a whole series of exhibitions which have attempted systematically to examine the great movements in design um, from essentially from the last part of the 19th century to the present day. And that's obviously important uh, for us at the V&A because if our mission is to help people to think about and enjoy and understand history of design, then our exhibition program needs to do that as well. Have you found that audiences, I mean, if you, if you are audiences, audiences, I don't know quite what people call them, but you know what I mean, by yes, audiences, mm. um, have audiences become better educated around design? I mean, it feels, it feels like it's very... Yes, I think so. I think you think? So. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, d d how would you track that discrimination? Well, I mean, I, mean, I, just, I, mean, I think, I mean, perhaps the, the uh, how, would, how would you know that well? I think you would know it by looking at the retail offer, because uh, actually yep. when you look at it, you can see that people are prepared to spend money on goods which they consider to be well designed, not only in fashion, but a whole lot of other areas. Uh, you can see uh, that there's a significantly greater interest than there used to be in the quality of built design. Yep. Uh, I mean, we're in a lovely building here, I think. But, uh, but actually, I think that the, the general public interest in the quality of, 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 of architecture has increased. You can see that uh, there are you know, numerous um, television shows and indeed lifestyle magazines which assume, as a matter of course, that their audience or their readership is going to be interested in uh, what design choices reveal about people. So yes, I would say that we, we inhabit it. And actually, if you think about the web, um, uh, you can see there too how important design is. So I would say that we were, um, uh, that we'd seen, you know, over the last few decades, yes, significant increases in, in awareness of design, and that's obviously excellent for the v and I'd love to say that we created that, obviously we haven't, but we certainly benefit from it, mm -hmm. because what we do is interesting to a wider public. How, 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 how do you relate to, because um, I was going to be the concurrent in a way, how do you, have there been emphasis on different kinds of audience getting, you know, has that kind of labour um, engagement um, agenda, which is, as it were, getting out beyond the people who would be, who, who have historically felt comfortable with museums and art. Has, has that, is that a difficult thing? I thought it was quite easy, actually, you know, but I mean, do you find that you need partner institutions well, I think, I, I think that, that people, particularly well-educated middle-class people, um, often make false assumptions about what you call the audience, although I agree with you that audience seems a strange term, the public for museums. That's to say that they assume that uh, museums are predominantly of interest to uh, people like themselves, you know, well-educated middle-class people. Actually, that isn't true. Um, it is true that, um, that art museums tend to have uh, that kind of um, audience profile, but actually if you look at other kinds of museums like our neighbours, the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum um, in, uh, in South Kensington, they have a very broad appeal in class terms. And if you look at ethnicity, so what kind is, what's the ethnic makeup of, of, um, uh, of the visitorship of different museums, well that varies a lot, uh, but in the v &A, um, uh, the ethnic makeup of our visitors is pretty much like the ethnic makeup of the country as a whole, and that is indeed because of our program. I and mean, we do lots of exhibitions like uh, I don't know Maharaja on mm -hmm. Indian princely uh, patronage or Black British style on Black British style, and so on. And the cumulative effect of all that programming is undoubtedly that people from many different backgrounds uh, seem to feel quite at home. You know. Uh, because there are things which interest them there and they, they feel that kind of what you were talking about as a 17 year old which is that kind of sense of commission and that sense of it being um, a kind of welcoming place. Yeah. Yes. 